Welcome once again. This is Bruce Porter for Lecture 3 in Biological Psychology, Evolution and the Mind. When we look at comparison between men and women, IQ correlates positively with brain size, or more specifically with dendrite mass, uh, for men and women separately. However, men have larger brains than women but the IQ is equal. Male and female brains differ anatomically in several areas and follow different developmental timelines. But behavioral differences between men and women are fairly small and these differences may better be explained as differences in interests than differences in abilities. Despite overall size difference, gray matter volume is the same in both men and women, possibly explaining the similar IQ scores. In biological psychologies, just as in life, we have to consider the mind, the mind brain connection or the mind brain problem. What is this relationship between the mind and the brain? When we're looking at the mind-brain problem, you want to, we look at it, or people look at it either as a dualistic problem, that is, the mind and the brain are entirely separate things and can be measured and studied separately. We look at it through uh, monoism, that there is either only the material or there is only the mental and these two don't mix. The problem with doing research on the mind-brain relationship is that consciousness is not observable. We can only infer other people's con consciousness. There's a group of uh, sophilists, uh, sophilicism, which says that I and only I exist. Everybody outside of me, the, you're just an illusion. The mind-brain problem, or the difficulty of knowing whether other people, or animals for that matter, have conscious experience. Even from the monoist position, discussions of consciousness must, be, must distinguish the easy problems from the hard problems. The easy problems are problems that pertain to phenomena which uh, we apply the term consciousness such as the difference between wakefulness and sleep and the mechanisms that enable us to focus our attention. Those are the easy problems. The hard problems are the questions of why and how any kind of brain activity is associated with consciousness. Animals and humans have many features in common, from the molecules all the way up to the way our brains are laid out and the way they function. The similarity between us and animals allows us to study the brain function in non-human animals. Personality and IQ tests can be given to both people and also to animals. One of the most common uh, personality assessments is called the five-factor model. Factor one is agreeableness. Factor two is openness to change. Factor three would be somebody's extroversion. Factor four is someone's conscientiousness. And factor five is neuroticism. You can measure both people and non-people according to these five uh, factors of personality. When we do this and over a long consistent uh, study and a long consistent time, there seems to be about 30% inheritable components of personality. That is, we get about 30% of our personality from our parents. The other 70% is environmental. That we develop our personalities through our environment. The universal similarities between brains across the animal kingdom, especially related uh, species, are evident when we compare 
brains to uh, for, of humans to non-humans. Even the lowly squid, who has a very small brain and very large neurons, functions, their brains function very similar, similarly to how the human brains function. Uh, comparing a rat to a human brain, we come up with very similar functions. The structures in the brain are arranged in a similar relationship to one another. The thing that's different is the size or the relative proportion of these structures. Another similarity can be found at the cellular level. Nervous systems throughout the animal kingdom are made of neurons. They have the same functioning and signaling systems. Life is similar at the molecular level, demonstrating what's known as the principle of common descent. There are two very popular misconceptions about our brain. One is, your brain is like a computer. Well, your brain is not like a computer. We process information, but that's about it. It is a survival machine that's been op optimized over millions of generations of natural selection to uh, help us survive, even by lying to us. And the second very popular myth is that we only use 10% of our brain. Now this myth is worldwide. It's used to motivate us to work harder. It's even used to explain things like paranormal phenomena. This myth started out, it's believed, with uh, William James. Uh, he said that we only use a small fraction of our brains. This was back in the 1800s, I believe. Then it was perpetuated again by a man named Dell Carnegie. Dell Carnegie wrote uh, How to Win Friends and Influence People, a very pop popular author and speaker. And in the foreword of his book, Dell Carnegie came right out and said, we only use 10% of our brain. Well, we use 100% of our brain. Two very popular misconceptions about the brain. But back to the evolution of the brain. Evolution is a change over generations in the frequency of variations in the various genes in the population. Offspring generally resemble their parents, but because of mutations and recombinations, new inheritable variations uh, in the gene pool can occur. And that's either through natural selection or artificial selection. Artificial selection would be breeding animals for desirable individual characteristics. This causes uh, changes in various frequencies of genes within a population. In humans, it was tried and believed through eugenics. And that's the artificial selection, the term for artificial selection in humans. And there's some popular misconceptions about evolution. One very popular misconception about evolution is the is the Lamarckian evolution. And this says that it's either the use or the disuse of some structure or behavior that causes an evolutionary increase or decrease in that feature. And that is absolutely incorrect. That is not evolution. Humans are no longer evolving because of modern medicine prosper uh, prosperity. And that's another. We, humans are still evolving. Evolution necessarily improves the fitness, that is the number of copies of one gene that endure for later generations of the population. This is another misconception. And a, another misconception, and, and a very powerful misconception, is that evolution acts to benefit the individual or to benefit the species. Evolution acts to benefit the gene. These are misconceptions of this. One problem that evolutionary psychologists uh, have had is what about altruistic behavior? You know, behaviors that benefit others rather than the individual committing this behavior. Uh, this is in contrast to that the, belief that the genes evolve. It takes very little thought to come up with why we might have altruistic behavior and why that actually benefits our gene pool. 
evolutionary psychology is the study of the relationship between social behavior and evolutionary theory. Evolutionary psychologists emphasize the functional explanations of behavior, that is, how a behavior may be useful to a population and why natural selection would favor it. Because the evolution ties all of our species together in a very intimate level on the cellular level, we can use animals in research. And there are some reasons why we use the animals in the research. Big one is that the underlying mechanisms that uh, promote behavior within species are similar across species. Uh, as this is specifically uh, through the mammalian species. And these, are, these behaviors are frequently easier to study in non-human species. We're also interested in animals just for their own sake. And what scientists learn about animals sheds, sheds light on human evolution. Certain experiments cannot be done on human subjects because of either legal or ethical restrictions. And there is an ethical debate on the use of animals in research. Oppositional, opposition to animal research ranges in considerable degrees. The minimalists believe that some animal research is acceptable, but wish it to be minimized and severely regulated. In the abolitionists, they believe that all animals deserve the same rights as human beings in that the use of animal subjects is the moral equivalent, equivalent to slavery or murder. Researchers in biological psychology realize that using animals in experiments is necessary for acquiring knowledge about behavior, but indeed uh, it may be painful to their subjects. Therefore, investigators often look for compromises when conducting animal research to reduce the suffering of animals.